Anybody have a testimony tonight about something you'd like to just praise the Lord about? Any word of testimony? Brother Fred, he's always, he's always got a testimony. He's always got something he's thankful for. Brother Fred, what do you got tonight? to be able to go to church and hopefully hear something that'll help to change us. Don't stay there. Brother Patrick, you got your hand up there. right. Makes me think of the song uh, Thank You Lord for Your Blessings on Me. I like that song. It's a good one. How many of you are thankful for your salvation tonight? Amen. Praise the Lord. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Imagine for uh, just a moment that you're God. You're the creator of the universe. You possess uh, all the power within yourself. And your people are being held as slaves. And the time has come to deliver them. You'd want to choose the right person for that job. You'd want to make sure that the person that you chose... Uh, would perhaps be some great military leader or some brilliant political mind or maybe uh, a great orator, a man uh, that, that could give heart-stirring speeches that would grip the hearts of men. If you had the population of the world at your disposal, would the man that you settle on have been Moses? I mean, just think about Moses for a second. At the time when God chooses him, he's 80 years old. He's a fugitive from justice. He's wanted for murder in Egypt. The very place that you're intending to send this deliverer. Now, yes, Moses was well-educated much more than, than a lot of the people at this time in the world because of, of the circumstances in which Moses grew up. But that was over 40 years ago. And yes, he had been well connected in the political circles of the day, but again, that was 40 years ago. Yet when it came time for God to send a deliverer to Israel, this is exactly the person that he chose to accomplish his will. Now to us humans, at least to me, this doesn't make a lot of sense. There were probably better qualified people for this mission. But to God, it was all part of a great plan. And we have the benefit of knowing the rest of the life of Moses. So we can see that that God's choice was right. We can put our stamp of, stamp of approval on God's choice. We can say, God, you did a good job there, right? Because he needs that. But while we think about this tonight, think on this other idea as well. That here we are living in the midst of a, of a wicked, sinful, perverse world that's dying and going to hell. We just came out of Missions Month thinking about reaching people around the world for Jesus Christ. Over 7 billion people. That's our mission. Reach 7 billion people with the gospel. Now, if I were God again, and I had to choose somebody to reach the entire world, it probably wouldn't be us. Other wicked, sinful humans. Why couldn't God just raise up some sort of super saint? Why, why couldn't God uh, just select... 
uh, maybe a few of the angels to get the job done. You wouldn't send a bunch of old sinners saved by grace to go tell a whole bunch of other sinners about that grace, would you? We're a bunch of flawed individuals. If we were God, we would want the, the brightest, most brilliant minds on top of this mission. We would want those people to be the ones used to accomplish His will in the world. Yet, when God chose to reach this world for Himself, He looked around and He decided that saved sinners make the best candidates for His work. Amen? And He hasn't changed His mind. That's still God's plan to accomplish His mission in the world today. He saved each and every one of us to be workers for His glory. He saved us to serve. So many times Christians become complacent in their spiritual life, and they're content to just walk through these doors, sit down in a pew, and feel that they are somehow accomplishing what God has for them. But let me tell you, that's not what God wants from us. He wants us to serve. Uh, remember what he said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He created us to do good works. Now, of course, we know that has nothing to do with salvation. But works is a part of God's plan for our lives. James chapter 2, verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. We've chosen the theme uh, for this church this year, Forward by Faith. Uh, a few years ago, we had the theme, Faith Works. Because if we are saved, if we have faith, there will be works that reinforce what we say. God created us to serve. His plan is for us to serve Him. And He's put me and He's put you within the body of Christ and in this local church with the ability to use our gifts and our talents for Him. And for a little while tonight, I want to think on the idea of using our gifts to serve God. Finding some way to serve Him in a greater capacity than I'm serving Him now. We've seen some, we've seen some exciting days recently here at church. We've seen attendance, uh, we've seen attendance go up. And it would be exciting to see that on a continual basis. And it would be exciting to see this church expand our reach within this community. But we can't do it with just one or two or three. It requires this entire membership working together, each person actively serving, finding ways to be involved to accomplish God's will right here. It's said that that 20% uh, of church members do 80% of the giving, do 80% of the work. That's kind of the standard just across all Christendom. And that ought not to be. 20% of a church carries 80% of the load. Could you imagine if a church had those numbers uh, reversed and you had 80% of the people doing all of the work? What a church could accomplish with 80% participation. When every single member is able to internalize what God has called us to do and sees the vision and the mission that God has for this church and begins to, begins to, to, to catch that spirit of excitement and that zeal, and they, they say, you know what, this isn't just the church that I go to or it's not just your church, this is my church. I'm going to be involved in it. I want to find some way to serve. I want to, I want to do something to see this church grow, and I want to be an active part of it. 
once you catch that vision, then the blessings of God begin to, to compound uh, on top of each other and overflow. And you see that throughout all different facets within the ministry when everybody within the church gets excited and begins to carry that work forward. Incredible things can happen. And God chooses us to be a part of that. But when that realization dawns on us, that it might require that I be involved somehow, that I do something more than I'm doing now, when we begin to think about that, sometimes we get excited about it at first. And the more we think on it, we begin to come up with excuses. We try to find every reason under the sun why we can't be the one that, that God wants to, to be involved. Surely God couldn't use me to do that. You're asked to teach a class and the excuses start. And you're asked to serve in the nursery and the excuses start. God, God puts it on your heart to, to begin witnessing uh, for Him and sharing your faith with friends and family, co-workers, neighbors. But then the excuses start. You're made aware of a need that, that you could provide. But then the excuses start. In fact, you're, you're asked to do just about anything for the Lord and the excuses start. You say, I, you know, I'm too busy. I'm already doing this. I can't do that. Maybe somebody else. And sometimes our excuses pile up on top of each other and they get in the way of doing something for God. It reminds me of the, of the story I heard about the, uh, the commanding officer. He was furious when nine of his enlisted men uh, who'd been out on passes, uh, didn't show up for roll call the next morning. Hour after hour went by. And it wasn't until 7 p.m. the next day that the first soldier walked through his door. He says, I'm sorry, sir. You see, I had this date. I lost track of time. I missed the bus. But I was determined to get back here on time, sir. And so, in order to get back, I hired a cab. But halfway here, the cab broke down. So I went over to this farmhouse, and I talked the farmer into selling me a horse to ride back. And, and as I got about halfway here, the horse died. And so I had, to, I had to walk the other 10 miles to get back here. And I just now got here. And so the, the colonel's a little bit skeptical about this. That he just gives the, he gives the soldier a reprimand and sends him on his way. However, after this guy comes seven more. The same exact story. Had a date, missed the bus, hired a cab, bought a horse, etc. By the time that ninth man came in, reported to the colonel, he was just sick and tired of it. All of these excuses. Okay, now what happened to you? He says, sir, I, I, you see, I, I had this date and I missed the bus. I hired a cab. The colonel just says, wait. Don't tell me the cab broke down. No, sir, replied the soldier. Wasn't it at all. Cab didn't break down. It was just there were so many dead horses in the road, we couldn't make it through. <laughs> Excuses, right? At least he came up with a clever one. But sometimes our excuses hold us back from accomplishing anything for God. And here in Exodus chapter 3, before we get to all the highlights of the ministry of Moses, Moses starts off with God with a whole bunch of excuses as to why Moses couldn't possibly be the guy that God is calling to accomplish his mission. And so we'll see Moses' problem, and we'll look into how the Lord handled Moses' excuses, and we find that he pretty uh, well skillfully handles ours as well. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 3 and Exodus chapter 4. There's some, some truths in each of these chapters and a wealth of encouragement. This message is intended to, to be an encouragement to you to, to look past excuses to, to put those things aside and to go forward by faith because the only way that this church actually goes forward is if the people within the church 
move forward. We can't do it without the cooperation of the membership of this local church. And so we'll find encouragement for the Christian who wants to serve God. Because there's, there's a lot of them, and you might be one of those. You say, you know, I would really like to serve God in some way. I would like to be involved in the ministry some way, but I just don't feel like I'm capable of doing it. So tonight, title of the message is The Use of Excuse. The Use of Excuse. And just to kind of give you the backstory before we jump into it, uh, Moses, again, has spent the last 40 years on the backside of the desert. He's now, after he runs from Egypt, after murdering the Egyptian, 40 years ago he decided he wanted to deliver God's people. He rushed the timing. He took things into his own hands and he tried to do it in his own strength, in his own way. And so God sends him to the backside of the desert to herd sheep and to learn some lessons from those sheep for 40 years. And now God feels that Moses is ready for this task. So he's out here with his father-in-law's flock of sheep at Mount Horeb. And we have the burning bush experience here where Moses sees this, he sees this burning bush that's, that's on fire but it's not consumed. And he says, I will now turn aside and see this great thing. By the way, that's one of my wife's favorite verses in the Bible. She says she can always picture, she can picture Moses out there on the side of the mountain and, and he sees this bush that's burning and he holds up his finger. He says, I will now turn aside and see this great thing. It's always struck, struck her as a funny verse. <laughs> Maybe you get as much enjoyment out of it as she does. I don't know. But Moses turns aside to see this, this bush that's on fire that is not consumed. And he approaches it, and God begins to speak to him out of this, out of this burning bush. And he begins to carry on a dialogue with God. And God tells him, Moses, I've chosen you to be the deliverer of my people. Now, 40 years ago, remember, Moses was all gung-ho about doing something right then. I mean, he got the knife out and killed the guy, and he was going to take on the, whole, uh, the, the entire Egyptian army, apparently, by himself. But now, after 40 years, being in the middle of the desert, he's not quite so sure of himself now. And we pick it up in verse number 11. The first thing that we're going to look at tonight is the excuse of inability. The excuse of inability. Uh, Moses' first concern is that, that he's a nobody and, and he's therefore unqualified to go to Pharaoh and, and demand the release of these people. Look at verse number 11 with me. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. We have the, we have the who am I question. Who am I, God, that, that I can't do this? The excuse of inability. Many in the church feel the exact same way. Uh, we feel that we aren't as qualified as somebody else. You know, I, I would do such and such, but I'm just not as qualified as, as brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. You know, they, they're just much more qualified than I am to do that. And they probably have the ability to get the job, the job done properly, and I don't. They, they're just so much more qualified. And we give up before we ever start to serve God. But we forget one important truth. God chose us. Moses forgot the truth that God chose him. God said, Moses, I want you. To say that we aren't able to do the job, to say that we aren't able to serve God in some capacity is to say that God doesn't know what He's doing. After all, who knows best, us or God? God doesn't make mistakes. Say it with me. God doesn't make mistakes. You see, Moses has changed a great deal in these 40 years. His humility, 
here at the beginning of this dialogue with God reveals some of the big changes that occurred in his thinking from 40 years earlier when he tried to deliver Israel on his own. Uh, Notice this. Then he was full of self-confidence, but now he's full of self-doubt. Then it was who I am. Now it is who am I. Then he thought he was somebody. Now he thinks he's nobody. Then he had all the answers, and now all he has are questions. Then he was courageous, and now he's timid. Then he was speeding, and now he's stalling. Then he thought he would conquer, and now he thinks he will be conquered. Then he was willing, but not ready. Now he's ready, but not willing. Forty years in the desert as a, as a shepherd has very much indeed changed the attitude of Moses. And while his concern does reflect some humbleness, God sent him there to teach him some lessons. And while it does reflect humbleness, Moses uses this show of humbleness to resist God's commands. And that's not a good thing. And there's a number of church members all across the world who sound the same way that Moses does. They say, oh, you know, I just, I can't teach. I couldn't be an usher. I don't have the ability to to help out on a work day. I couldn't help in the nursery. There's no way that I could possibly feed a missionary or a guest preacher. I couldn't give any extra income of mine to the church. I wouldn't be able to sing in the choir. I couldn't help work with the children. And it all sounds so humble, but sometimes it's what we call a false humility. Sometimes it disguises our rebellion against God. When we know that He wants us to do something, and yet we make up excuses as to why we can't. Then in verse number 12, God responds to Moses and to us. And he he gives two different promises, very precious promises. Look at verse number 12. And he said, certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. First he says, Moses... I'm going to be with you. And it's the promise of His presence. Certainly, I will be with thee. It's a tremendous promise to know that God said He would be with Moses. This should have encouraged Moses. Here he is fearful. And God says, Moses, I'll be with you. It was not Moses alone against Pharaoh. It wasn't Moses alone dealing with the children of Israel. But it was Moses and God. And that's a big difference. The presence of God should have alleviated the fears of Moses. You know, as a, as a small child, I can remember there were different things that I was afraid of. Most of us were that way as children. There would be things that we were afraid of. I remember being a, being a, a young child and at night... I always wanted to go to sleep before my parents did. If I knew that they were still up and awake, I always felt more comfortable. And back in, back in these early days, uh, my dad would, he was an insurance salesman, and so his office was located in my bedroom. So a lot of times I'd go to bed and he would do paperwork up into the night. My goal was always to try to go to bed before he left the room. Because if dad was with me, Everything was okay. Or we'd go to some place that I might be afraid of. I wouldn't want to go by myself. But if Dad was with me, I was never scared to go anywhere. Because Dad's with me. He's looking out for me. He's taking care of me, right? Are you with me? What's the picture? We have a Heavenly Father. We're His child. He says, I'll be with you. He says, Moses, I'll go with you. We don't have anything to be scared of. We don't have anything to be afraid of. Uh, When the Heavenly Father is with us, and when Christ gave the great commission to His disciples, and the commission that's passed on to us, 
What does he say in Matthew 28, 20? He says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. God promises that he'll be with us. Psalm chapter 118, verse number 16, it says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? I used that verse with the children this morning, encouraging them to share their faith. It says, the Lord's on my side. If you're saved, if you're a child of God, He's promised you over 365 times in the Bible, it says, do not fear. There's one for each day, all sorts of verses that talk about not fearing because God's on our side. We don't have to be afraid. God will be with us. If you're afraid to serve God, if you're afraid to be involved, you can get over that fear because God says, I'll be with you. And it's just like Dad saying, it's okay, I'm with you. Those fears are relieved. I feel like I can do whatever it was that I needed to do because Dad's watching over me. Heavenly Father's watching over us. Secondly, he says, after you accomplish what I've sent you to do, he says, I'll meet you back here. He's promising Moses that they will get the victory. He says, you're going to go to Egypt. You're going you're to conquer Egypt. You're going you're to deliver the children of Israel. You're going to make it, and you're going to come right back here, and I'm going to meet you right back here. God makes him that promise of a reunion. So with these truths in mind, there's some applications that can be made to our lives today. If God has called us, He's done so with the full knowledge of our weaknesses and our inabilities. We don't have to tell God about our weaknesses, do we? God knows us intimately. In Psalm uh, 103, 14, he says, For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. God knows everything about us. We don't have to try to explain to him why we can't do something, why we can't serve him. If God has called us, he knows that we can accomplish the task through his power. Philippians 4.13, what does it say? I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. God knows about our fears. He knows about our weaknesses. He knows about our inabilities. But he knows that with his power... We can accomplish the tasks that He wants us to accomplish. And when He sends us out into His work, He never sends us alone. Again, lo, I'm with you always. Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He's made these promises to Moses. He's making these promises to us. We just need to get involved, yield ourselves to Him and say, God, use me. If your excuse to why you can't be involved, as to why you don't do more, is some inability, you know who it is that causes you to have those thoughts? It's Satan himself. The Bible says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. When you get those thoughts of, God, I'm just not able to do that, you need to send those thoughts right back to the hell where they came from, right back to the, to the, to the demons who sent them to you. In and of ourselves, we are incapable of anything good, anything godly. But through the power of God, we can do anything. We were unrighteous, filthy, rotten, dirty sinners, unclean. But when Christ saved us, the Bible says, man, this is why I love the book of Romans. The Bible says that when Christ saved us, that he gave us his righteousness. So many times we just read that and we, we kind of walk over that. But what that means is that God literally sees us as his children, as perfect, as clean, as spotless, and as holy as his own son, Jesus Christ. And through his Holy Spirit, he enables us and has chosen us. He chose us 
to accomplish his mission in the world. Now, I don't know about you, but that's kind of exciting. And it ought to excite us. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can accomplish great things, even in small numbers. God is not limited by the number of people in this room. As we read through this book, there are many times where we see small numbers of people used in huge ways. How about Gideon and his army? That's a pretty small group, huh? David's mighty men? There's just a handful of them. A few of them fought for David all the way to Jerusalem just to get him a cup of water and to fight back. I mean, these were just a few, a handful of guys. But God used them in big ways. The Apostle Paul, I mean, that's just one man. But God used Paul maybe in a greater way than any other human being has ever been used. And God can use a church just like ours. It's not the biggest church. But God can use this church in a great way if we're totally yielded to Him. As an entire body, we yield ourselves to Christ. That's the excuse of inability. Second, we see the excuse of inadequacy. The excuse of inadequacy. Verse number 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? After Moses finishes telling God about all of his inabilities and saying, Who am I? Then he says, Who are you, by the way? When they ask me, What am I going to tell them? Moses moves on to talk about all of his inadequacies. Moses is saying to God, he said, I just don't know enough about who you are. I would do something for you if I just knew a little bit more about you. And many believers are in the same, in the same shape as Moses this evening. Uh, not only do we feel that we're incapable of serving the Lord as we should, but we feel that, that we're just inadequate, that somehow uh, we just don't know enough about God. We don't know enough about His Word. What if they ask this question? What if they ask that question? What if somebody challenged me on this? I just don't know enough to serve God. I couldn't get the job done. Well, look at God's response to Moses and to us. Verse number 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now we don't have time to get into talking everything about everything that that name, I am that I am, encompasses because there's a lot to talk about in that name, the, the name of God, Jehovah, Yahweh. Uh, there's a lot to talk about that just goes with that name. We don't have time for this. It's a great study. But God's response to Moses is to remind him that he is the I Am. While Moses may be inadequate, the God who has called him and the God who equips him is certainly not. Our God is not inadequate of anything. God is in essence saying to Moses, he says, Just do as I say and I will show you who I am as you need me to. Here's a few other things I think that God was saying to Moses in these words. He's saying, uh, Moses, I am all you need. When you go to Egypt and you need courage to face Pharaoh, I am your courage. When you need wisdom to know what to say, I am your wisdom. When you need strength, I am your strength. And whatever you need, God says, Moses, I am your need. And that's how God works in our lives. He leads us out to follow Him by faith. This requires faith. And we know little, uh, very little about Him or His ways. We may not know all of the answers. We may feel inadequate. But as the needs arise, 
God proves himself adequate and faithful to every challenge. We just sang the song tonight, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, how I've proved him o'er and o'er." Have we really proved God? Do we really trust him or do we feel inadequate? His great name, I am. It becomes an open-ended statement of fact. In those two words, God tells us that He is what we need Him to be at every moment in our life. Whatever we need in that moment, God says, I am. That's powerful. He didn't say, I was. That wouldn't be very comforting. God, I need some strength. I need some courage. Well, I was that. Too bad. Ran out of all that. Don't have anything for you tonight. Or I will be someday in the future. Work hard enough and strive hard enough and prove yourself to me and then I might give you a little courage. Find your way down the yellow brick road and, you know, you go see the wizard and he'll give you some courage, right? God says no. You need courage. You need strength. I am. You can find it within Him. He's, he, he's, every time Moses throws up an excuse, God immediately takes it out of the way. Every time we throw an up, uh, up an excuse to God and say, God, I would do this, but God's already taken our excuses away. He says, I am. Trust me. There's not a situation you'll ever find yourself in that God doesn't hold the solution to. He is able, and He enables us as we go through life. Sometimes it's scary to go off by faith. How about Abraham? Set off on a journey, didn't know where he was going, but by faith he followed God. When we look at the size of the task and compare our abilities to it, we'll, we often see that we're lacking this or we're lacking that or we need more of this for true success. But many times we leave out God in the equation. We forget to figure in His power. Don't ever let a lack of education, a lack of money, a lack of skill or any other thing stop you from being everything that God wants you to be as a Christian, as a member of this church specifically. Don't let anything stop you from being involved and in being what God wants you to be. Even if you can't see within yourself the resources needed, just be faithful to obey Him who's called you and placed you in His work. Uh, remember Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 20. It says, Now unto Him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in it. That's what God is. Noah probably didn't feel adequate beside the ark. David must have felt pretty small next to Goliath. The three Hebrews probably felt... Uh, inadequate against the furnace. Daniel must have looked pretty inadequate beside the lion's den. But God took care of them, didn't he? David said, yeah, I am pretty small compared to that giant, but look how big my God is compared to Goliath. God took care of them. Time after time after time as we read through this book, we find the encouragement, we find the help that we need. Don't ever use... The excuse of inadequacy. And then we see the excuse of inferiority. Chapter number 4. You'd think after all of these gracious revelations and these promises that God has made to Moses, that Moses uh, would stop resisting God's summons. But Moses was human just like us. He thought he'd try again. Maybe God will run out of ways to use me. But not so. Verse number 1, chapter 4. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. They'll think I'm a crazy. I tell them, you know, God showed up to me in a burning bush out there on the backside of the desert, and he was speaking to me. I mean, would you believe the guy that showed up started saying that? So Moses says, These people aren't going to believe that I actually talk to you. 
Even though Moses witnessed the fire in the bush that did not consume the bush, and he heard the voice of God speak personally to him, he was promised the presence of God in his work. He was given the marvelous revelation of the name of God. He was told that Israel would hearken to his voice. He was informed that after Egypt was smitten by the divine hand, that Israel would be able to leave Egypt. He was assured that when Israel left Egypt, they would leave with all the riches of Egypt. And still, Moses continued to object. After the Lord handles all of Mo uh, Moses' other excuses, Moses decides that if he tells people that he's had a personal meeting with God himself, they'll decide Moses is lying. Verse number 2, The Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? What is that in thine hand? That's a very interesting question. Do you think God was scratching his head trying to figure out what Moses was holding. Moses answered, he said, a rod. He's got a shepherd's rod. God had a lapse of, of eyesight there for a minute, couldn't see very well. What are you holding, Moses? Is that what God was asking? God didn't need to see what was in Moses' hand. You know who needed to see what was in Moses' hand? Moses. God's omniscient, he knew what was there. He's trying to direct Moses' attention to what's there. When God asks you about something that you have, it's often an appeal from God to use it in His service. He's going to ask you, what's in your hand? What talent, what spiritual gift has God given to you? Because He has. Every born-again child of God has some spiritual gift. And God says, what's that in your hand? I can, I'm, not, I'm not able to serve God. I'm not, I'm not adequate enough. God says, what's in your hand? What have I given you? If God is going to further his work through Moses, he's got to have what's in Moses' hand to do it. If God is going to show a miracle to Moses, he's got to have Moses' rod. And if we're going to do anything for God, we've got to be willing to give God what's in our hand. If we're stingy, if we're unwilling, if we refuse, we hinder God's work, and we hinder our own faith. So many church members are that way. You've got something in your hand. You've got something that God can use. And again, we don't have time to talk about everything that Moses' rod becomes. But God uses that rod of Moses as a great instrument for all of Israel, for all of the world to see the power of God. When we refuse to give God what's in our hand, we will always seem to be unfulfilled in our lives. Moses answers simply, it's a rod. It's about three to six feet in length. It's nothing special. There's nothing fantastic about this rod. Moses sees nothing special about it. <laughs> but God did. In fact, that rod earns the name in the Bible, the rod of God. You see, what's in our hand is generally appraised lower by us than it is by God. We think less of what God has given us than He does. God's use of Moses' rod demonstrates that, that He can use insignificant things if they are yielded to His control. The parting of the Red Sea, Moses holds out his rod. He casts the, the rod down and it becomes a serpent. Throughout Scripture, we see all sorts of things that God used with that insignificant, seemingly worthless staff. Ehud had a single dagger in his hand, but it was used to give Israel freedom. Shamgar had an ox goad, but he used it to give God's people relief from oppression. Gideon and his men had a pitcher, lamp, and a trumpet in their hands. Hardly impressive weapons to rout the Midianites. 
David had but a sling and a stone. The widow only had two mites. She's been used as a great example of faith for millions and millions over these past 2,000 years. Small, insignificant things to us. God says what's in your hand. You have something that God wants from you. You have some gift. You have some talent. You have some ability that God has equipped you with, and He wants you to use it for His service, for His honor, and for His glory. Will you yield it to God? The key is not in how how impressive an object is. It's what we do with it. There's a lot of talented, impressive people that have talented gifts, that have impressive gifts, that have great abilities. But God doesn't use them. God uses simple things for great purposes. God uses what we have. He never demands from us what we don't have. And we never know the full potential of what God has given us until we yield it completely to Him. God's response to Moses is to let him know that when the Lord gets done working in him and through him, that the people in Israel, God says, as you read down here through uh, through chapter 4, God uses that rod to do some miracles right then. He says, Moses, when you go and you tell the people that you talk with me, trust me, they're going to know that I am the one who sent you. There will be no doubt in their mind, that you are my chosen deliverer. We're not inferior to anyone. Moses is afraid that he's inferior to all these other people. And God says, you're not inferior. And he tells us the same thing. And then lastly, we see the excuse of infirmity. Verse number 10, chapter 4. Moses said unto the Lord, Oh, oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since. Thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. He says, in a last-ditch effort to try to somehow get out of serving God, Moses appeals to some sort of speech impediment that he has. We don't know a lot about it. Maybe it was just at this one moment. Maybe he stutters as he's talking to this burning bush in front of God. I might stutter too. He says, God, I'm just not an eloquent enough speaker. Whatever the infirmity, Moses tried to use it as an excuse. Don't let anything become an excuse for you not to serve God, not to be involved, not to do the will of God. Many of God's children are just like Moses. They'll look at their lack of education, lack of income, physical handicap, whatever it is. They'll say, ah, I just better I just better stay on the sidelines for this one. I better just go ahead and hold down one of these pews. Wouldn't want to get too involved. I have some sort of infirmity. I've got some reason why God can't use me. Whatever you hold in your hand, God can use it. If we yield it to him, and when we choose not to, when we choose to make excuses, Be aware that our excuses can become a discouragement to those around us. When we look at that number in Christianity, in the average church where you have 20% of the people doing 80% of the work, stop and think about those 20% of the people. They can become discouraged at times. They say, you know what? I I am going to try to do something more. They'll take on one more thing to do. The 20% that are doing all the work, they really don't need to do something else, do they? When they don't see anybody else step up to do it, they say, well, I've got to do my part. And that person takes on some more of the weight. Many times we see some of those 20 percenters burn out after a while. When we all work together, lightens the load. It encourages each other. It stirs the the fire. It fans the flame. 
And Satan can use our excuses as a wedge. Discouragement's one of his favorite tools. We don't need someone else to do what God's calling us to do. We need to do it ourselves. It's not somebody else's responsibility. There's many things that as a church we would like to do and we'd like to accomplish. We've just got to have people to do them. And as we go through this summer, there may be some new ministries that are introduced and there may be some new avenues of service that become available. I wish the pews were full. There's a, there's a lot of the 20 percenters that are here tonight. Let me tell you, a lot of the people in this room are some of the 20 percenters. There's other people who need to hear this sermon that need to help carry the weight. But maybe you're here and you say, you know, I, I can do more. I could do more than I'm doing now. As you begin to hear about some of these avenues where, where we're going to try to reach out more, maybe it's God wants you to be involved in that. Some people think that, well, you know, I'll just go to church, and if anybody ever wants me to do anything, they'll approach me, but I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to keep my mouth shut, and hopefully they don't ever find out about what I can do. Well, that's not the right attitude either. God's given you some sort of spiritual gift. You might be able to teach a class. You might be able to pass out tracts. You might be able to go with us and, and knock on some doors. You might be able to bake cookies as we take them to people who visited. We're looking at all sorts of different ways that we can minister to people. You can pray. You can be involved. Say, well, I'm not that great of a singer. Can you run a lawnmower? I mean, even some of these guys that run lawnmower, I mean, just look at all the tracks they leave in the yard out there. See, you don't have to be that qualified to run a lawnmower. Right, Brother Al? You, if you know how to get stuck, you're, you're capable of being a mower around the church, aren't you? Whatever it is that's in your hand, God can use it, and he wants to use it. In verse number 11, God says to Moses, he says, Who's made man's mouth? Who maketh the dumb or the deaf or the seen or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. We don't have to be afraid of being used by God. He says, I'll be with you. God's just looking for, for some vessels that are willing to be used in some way. And maybe there's something that God's calling you to do. I don't know what it is. But I know most of us can do more than we are doing. It'll require some sacrifice on our part. Say, so, you know, I, I would be involved in this, or I would be involved in that, but that would probably take up a little bit of my time. Well, it will. It takes some time to mow the churchyard, doesn't it? You could be somewhere else doing something. It takes some time to be ready to teach a class. It takes some requirement to be in the choir. But the blessings of God, you receive blessings from it and others receive blessings because of what you're involved in. So yes, there may be some sacrifice required. But Jesus isn't asking us to die for Him. He died for us. Couldn't we give up something for Him? Romans chapter 12. He says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present yourselves a living sacrifice. God doesn't want you to die. He wants you to live for Him. To be a living sacrifice. And Paul says, after all that Jesus Christ has done, after all that God has done for us, that's the only logical and reasonable expectation is that we yield ourselves back to Him as channels, as vessels, as instruments in His hands. Let's bow our heads. Have a moment of invitation. And if God's spoken to you,